What's going on, friends and fam? Phil and Dave back with episode dose, episode two. What's up, what's up? Yeah, we are back, and the question that kind of came up recently, um, it's a friend that reached out to me, and she asked me if her little brother should start to work in this industry, and the industry, I mean the automotive industry, if you have not heard our first episode go back to the first episode yep. listen to it go listen to it now yes shut like, this one off and go listen to the first one <laughs> <laughs> like share and subscribe <clears throat> um but if you listen to our first episode uh me and dave uh we actually work at a car dealership alpine buick gmc shout out to them shout in out. littleton colorado mm -hmm. and we currently work here um i've done a little bit of everything but dave is is pretty much um the top technician top mechanic in the back shop so um being as how my friend reached out to me and asked me if her little brother should work at a dealership uh, not even a dealership work in the industry i i didn't know so i figured that me and dave would talk about this um i mean what do you think if you had a little brother and he was 17 16 18 20 years old and he said dave i want to get into this field what would you tell him i mean that's kind of what I did when I was younger. You know, I said, I want to, you know, start messing around with cars because I was real big into, you know, NHRA and drag racing and stuff. Um, but there's a lot to think about before you, you know, you hop into an automotive career. I mean, you oh, could yeah. you could probably get away with, you know, getting hired on at like a mom and pop shop and, you know, where they have like, they already have the tools there for you to, you know, change oil and stuff like that. Um, but you, you you can't rely on on that, you know. Yeah. Because when I got started into this, you know, the the mom and pop shop I worked at, they were they were awesome. You know, they they had the uniforms. You know, they had the you know the wrenches, everything that we needed to change oil, which was cool. Um, but which which you, is nice because not a lot of people supply that to you. Exactly, especially for being like a, a family owned you know shop. Yeah. Um, so I was I was grateful to get started in that spot, um, and I had kind of outgrown it. So I said, "Well, um, I want to get into a dealership." So I started looking into that stuff, and every single dealership that I looked at, um, one of the requirements was you need your own tools. Yeah, yep. and that is where it gets really, really expensive. I mean, you you can you can go out and go cheap, you know, like Harbor Freight. Um, I definitely wouldn't recommend like, you know, Walmart or you know, <laughs> yeah. parts store tools. Um, yes. But that's where it gets expensive. Um, I started off with like a, you know, a little cart, and this was a little, you know, flip drawer, you know, um, flip top one drawer cart. I spent two hundred dollars on that thing. Oh, easy, easy, and yeah. This was me, you know, jumping into a dealership. I was ready to go. I spent two hundred dollars on a cart. I went to Harbor Freight and spent probably another hundred dollars on, you know, sockets and screwdrivers and wrenches, just miscellaneous little stuff that I knew I would need to get by with just changing oil because I was getting hired on yep. at the dealership to change oil and rotate tires. I was not coming in to you know, fix anything whatsoever. The biggest expense was the tools. I mean, if you if you are interested in, you know, getting into the industry, you have to get that instilled in your head that you are going to have to spend money. Because I, I'm not gonna, you know, see how many guys I have seen in this industry that refuse to buy tools. And I will, I, I kid you not, they are some of the most lost technicians I have ever seen. <laughs> yeah. They will literally get their butts kicked by a car because they don't have the right stuff. Yes. And that's that's what you have to understand. Like I had I, I can't even tell you how much money I have spent in tools, but like, you know, I spend that money because it makes me money. If I didn't spend all the money on tools, I would probably still be changing oil somewhere because there's no way I could do my job now without any of my tools. Right. So that's, if you want to get started in this industry, understand that you are going to be spending a lot of money on tools. It's a great industry. I've learned so much. Like I went from being, you know, a little driveway mechanic, you know, fixing stuff on my own car to now I'm 
you know, tearing engines apart and putting new pistons in them, you know, it's, it's crazy. I never thought that I would be where I'm at now, um, six years ago. It's, it's definitely worth it if it's something that you are like for sure willing to do. Right. Now, would you recommend right off the bat if someone's 18 and they said, I want to get into this industry, I'm 100% dedicated and they're going through school and stuff or whatever it be, or even if they're not going through school, just right off the bat go and snap on Cornwell Matco or should they just start with the the more less expensive tools and then work up as they need it or just um, I would work up as you need it um, I, I will tell you in the six years I've been doing this I've seen a lot of guys get into a lot of trouble with tool guys yes because some of these kids they'll get out of they'll get out of tech school and they say I want the best of the best I want snap on everything I want to look like the big guy in the shop you know I worked out of a five drawer cart and a little craftsman cart for my first two years at the Auto Nation dealership I worked at wow <laughs> and and I, I I bought what I needed you know I I made sure I had the tools to do my job and as I started to do more I bought more and now you know, I have a, you know, a big ass triple bank snap on box and, you know, my cart and my box are filled with tools, but I didn't, yeah. I didn't go out and spend 30 grand right away, you know, and I've seen so many of these kids do that. Um, yeah. The, you can buy good tools and not spend a lot of money. Right. Um, the, the main tool guys, they, they have, you know, like the snap on Matco and the Cornwell some guys have Mac out there. I haven't. I've never seen a Mac truck. Drive, right. But. I I've seen a Mac truck driving and eating at Burger King, but I've yeah. never seen any yeah. tools or anything from Mac. And ninety percent of the time, those big name dealers, they have, you know, the a cheaper version of their name brand tool. Like Snap On has Blue Point, Macco has Silver Eagle, Cornwall has Blue Power. I mean, they're all good tools that they still offer you know lifetime warranties on so you don't have to go and spend seven hundred dollars on you know a set of sockets you can spend 200 and get the same quality because you, you have to start off small because if you go out and absolutely if you go out and spend all this money literally your tool bill a month is probably going to be a lot of money you know, I, I, when I had, when I, when I was buying it, tools, it's almost a car payment to it, some people, honestly, it, it turns out like that. There was a couple guys that worked here that, you know, they had a tool bill that was $400 a month. And like, I'm like, holy cow, you know, and it, the way I did it with, if I ever held any kind of credit or, you know, like a truck account with a tool guy, I would buy one thing, pay it off before I bought another. I would never have over highly recommended highly highly recommended yeah don't don't ever rack up like you know five or six grand on a tool truck because then you're you're just paying on that forever and then when you actually need a tool you're gonna feel like an you know you know you're gonna feel dumb when you have to tell the tool guy like hey I, I need this tool but he's gonna be like dude you owe me six grand exactly, still. right like, I can't just I can't float you this tool so that's another thing to watch out for too is the don't don't get into trouble with the tool guys um definitely start off small and work your way up like i said like i said i worked yeah. out of a five drawer um roll around car i put everything i needed in that you know and that followed me around the car and then i had another little cart that i you know put all my other miscellaneous stuff in and that did the job for a while <clears throat> and and just kind of touching on what he was saying um i have a horror story too of actually the guy that hired me i mean the the guy that had told me about the hiring um at this position when i was a porter that same guy was a technician and he no longer works here but he racked up i think an 11 or 13 thousand dollar tool bill and this guy that had gotten me the job he went to um a certain school to learn how to be a mechanic he came to the dealership he was a mechanic and then one day he just woke up out of the blue and said I don't want to be a mechanic or a tech anymore and so he went to sales and when he went up to sales he thought he was ducking and dodging the tool guys and when you have thirteen thousand dollars or whatever it was in debt they 
hit him, you know, with a repossession. Like the tool guys, it is a scary thing, honestly. Like you can get into major trouble into like, you can have your credit dinged. Like it is like a car. Yeah. It is. Yeah. The tool guy, like it's, it's no joke. So I agree with what Dave said. Like you got to grow into everything. Um, yeah, but you're, you're not going to need all of these fancy pullers and presses and yes, you know, fuel exactly. gauge testers. You're not going to need all of that when you start out. All you're going to need is the basic, basic stuff and talk to any any senior tech that you you know if you land in a, if you land in any kind of shop find the senior guy there you know not the old grouchy one yeah. but the one who knows his stuff and i guarantee you he will say the same thing you do not need to go out and buy snap on this snap on snap on snap on and just rack up a twenty thousand yeah. dollar bill your first year and then in six months you don't even want to do it then you're stuck with twenty thousand dollars worth of tools yep. and then the tool guys aren't just going to take them back and say, okay, you're clear. Yep. You've already exactly. used them. You still owe them at least half of that money. Yep. So I've seen so many people get into trouble with tool guys. And I mean, there's even a few guys here at the shop now that I'm like, dude, what are you doing with this tool guy? Yeah. They, they, they pinch pennies and they don't, you know, they buy cheap crappy cars, but yet, you know, their cars are five, six grand, whatever it be. And then they have a fifteen twenty thousand dollar tool debt and then think that you know us that have twenty thousand dollar vehicles are stupid you know so um, and they say well i'm only paying you know 80 a week and i'm like dude you're how many years for the rest of your life yeah <laughs> if you if you're paying 80 dollars a week and your bill's 20 grand you are you are in debt to that snap-on guy for the rest of your life unless you literally cut him a check yeah. Um, and that's that's the other thing too. These these snap on guys, these tool guys in general, they will they will sell you anything. They they I like to say that they they prey on newbies, prey on on they, the people fresh out of college. They do. Some of them. There are some really good tool guys out there that are like, Nah, dude, I'm not gonna put you in this stuff because I I they've seen they've seen it and no tool guy wants to go and repo your stuff and. You know, ding your credit and yeah. you have to call your mom because you didn't make your you know payment. You know, um, but it's it's for sure happens, man. Yes, I've, I've seen that. I've oh, seen it a lot. So many times we we've seen that. I mean, both of us have seen that so many times. You know, like my buddy that that had thirteen thousand dollars and decided to go to be a, a salesman or whatever. Yeah. Like that 13 grand doesn't go away like you need to pay that off but he let it go and he got his credit dinged worse than um i think he's ever had it dinged in his life um but and like what dave said uh you know i was a technician too uh, i was a lube tech and then i went to a uh an apprentice and then i went to a technician on my own and i agree 100 percent um you know when i was a lube tech i would slowly start to get my my stuff and I would slowly uh, start to accumulate like the flashlights and like the little tools necessary, like maybe gloves, um, you know, little picks, just little, little tools that you know, like once you go into a lube shop, once you start at the bottom, you start to know and realize what you need and what you don't need. Yeah. Um, as I, I went to the, you know, going to the back shop as, as they call it, um, when I was an apprentice, I had the harbor freight i'm not knocking anything from them but i had the harbor freight like the quote cheaper of the tools um and then i learned once i had my little arsenal my array of stuff and i learned what wasn't strong enough what wasn't big enough what wasn't powerful what broke and what didn't break whatever did break that i was using you know whether it be a wrench or a socket set or, or like the teeth that are inside the wrenches or whatever it be then I would go out and spend money and say, okay, I'm going to go to one of those suppliers that has the good lifetime warranty yeah. on that tool. But there are some tools that I've had from when I was a lube tech yeah. to even when I was, yeah, when I was working by myself as a mechanic that had never broken that still, you know, are doing great to this day. So I agree. Wow. Right. And, and, and I agree. Like you don't, you shouldn't go out there unless you're made of money and mom and dad are paying for you or someone has inherited money towards you or whatever. I would not go out and spend 20000 out the gate because like my buddy was thirteen grand in debt. You don't even know if you're going to do this the rest of your life. Exactly. And then just pay it off as you go. That's, that's probably the smartest way to do it. 
I mean, the best way, hands down, to do it. And then the, the the further into this you get into it, you'll start to notice what you use all the time, and the stuff that you tend to use every day, that's the stuff you want to spend money on. Like, yes, exactly. Like I use my my air impact guns every day, all day long. So that was those were things that I had to spend money on. Sockets, I spent money on those because I use those every day. But you know, even me now being a, a main line tech. I still have, you know, random stuff that I've bought from Harbor Freight because it's like things that I'll use maybe once every other month that, you know, I right. don't I don't use it every day. So I can spend, you know, I can have this cheaper tool that I don't have to worry about, hey, if this thing breaks, I'm I'm out, you know, 300 bucks. No, if this thing breaks, I'm out 20 bucks. You like know, it's it's be you got to be smart about it too, you know. Right. And and like Dave said, um, you know, he some of these air guns you know to take off tires these half inch um you know air guns i we looked in the magazine yeah, a couple hundred bucks yeah they go anywhere from three to six hundred dollars for one gun you know yeah. and your whole tools like the the arsenal of tools that you have and i was the one that like probably out of the whole shop i was the harbor freight slash home depot slash lowe's you know i would be spending 80 90 120 dollars on my half inch air gun to be taken off tires well i was laughing at these other guys saying oh you spent four five six hundred dollars you're the idiot but i it, with my 90 dollar gun 120 dollar gun how many i've been through probably four or five guns yeah. so yeah and my right i have I, a 500 dollar maco and i bought that when i started and i still have it exactly i bought that gun five years ago i mean and if you take care of it It'll last you. And I have, you know, s sockets on there that I bought when I was a lube tech at AutoNation, you know, and I still have the same set. Yeah. It's... You you learn as you're going, yep. being a technician. It's a big learning curve, not only with tools, but, I mean, all the other stuff you're doing on cars. You learn, you learn about different stuff every day, like time management and how to manage your tools and how to what to spend your tool money on yeah. like you being a technician is a it's a crazy job <laughs> yeah you like i said i i started out at the bottom and worked and i was a technician for a little bit of time i was probably a technician for mm, two years on my own something like that um and every day is an adventure um now to touch on like not only if if you're like what we said the original question if dave had a little brother and he his brother wanted to come into the industry or i had a little brother and they wanted to come into the industry you know that's the technician mechanic side um if you want to come in as a porter that's also a good starting point because um i've had a lot of i i haven't had a lot of people i've seen a lot of people come in as porters and they will know right away that is the first fundamental base stepping stone if you can't make it as a porter you don't like it as a porter you're not going to make it in the industry and you're probably not going to like you know independent dealerships wherever it be yeah. um i think being a porter is a great stepping stone absolutely because you see every part of the dealership you see, yeah exactly you exactly see every bit every bit you have to deal with me in the back you have to deal with the service advisors you have to deal with the quick lube guys you being a porter you're you're almost like the backbone of the shop even though you may not think think that you are but that's true i never thought of that porters do a lot you yeah. know and if if there weren't porters here you know how screwed it would be oh yeah I, yeah a lot of places take yeah, them, yeah. take them for for granted that you is, know? that's very true um um but if if you want to see how a dealership runs go be a porter yeah you'll absolutely see, you, you'll see technicians you'll see loop techs you'll see the service riders like like dave said you you see it all like i mean um you know our our porters the people call them um lot techs slash porters slash shaggers what, whatever you want to call them um but we just call them porters so um they you know they take out the trash they pull in cars for technicians they um clean wash off the cars right clean them off if they're snowy they wash the cars um, they pull up 
customer cars when they need to you know be delivered to them they do a little bit of everything take customers home pick yeah customers up yep yeah they go get parts if we need them to get parts because our parts guy is gone I mean, actually now that we talk about it they do do a lot well, actually porters do porters do a lot man and yeah there are some porters out there that like don't do a lot but you know that there are good ones that like they do a lot man yeah um Th that is a that is a good stepping stone. I think before you become a technician or just hop right from um, schooling or like from an independent shop or wherever like a Grease Monkey or Jiffy Lube and then you try to come into a dealership, yeah. I think being a porter is amazing. That's where I started. Yeah, um, yeah get an interview with a, with a dealership to be a porter and when you get interviewed, tell that service manager that you, you want to see how it's like because you might want to be a technician. Yeah. You know, you want to yeah. dip your feet in and get a feel for it, you know, because some dealerships, man, some of them are, some of them are rough. Like if you're at a really fast paced, quick dealership, yeah. I mean, you're like, like the ones that have six porters, you know, if there was just one or two of those dudes there, I wouldn't be able oh, to last there's there. There's no way. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, and here we got what, four, four. Yeah, we we have three, three or four. Yeah, I, we we have four porters right now, and and all of them are constantly busy doing yeah, stuff all the time. Um, picking people up, you know, trash the whole shebang, cleaning the shop. It's that's definitely probably the best way to get involved in the automotive industry now yeah. that I now that I'm actually talking about it too. Yeah. It's, or or um, if if you feel like that's not your forte, like maybe you did go to schooling for it, maybe you have a little bit more knowledge and passion. Uh, starting as a lube tech, as an oil change guy, as a level C technician, as a bottom grunt, but you're still working on the vehicles, even though you're only doing oil changes, tire rotates, you know, replacing light bulbs, whatever it be, that is a good starting point too, um, because there's a lot of people and a lot of friends that I've seen and uh, that have come through and like a lot of people that have become friends with and stuff, like, you know, I've been here almost nine years, so I've seen a lot of lube tech kids oil change tech kids and they say i want to be a master tech asc certified mechanic whatever it be and they go into quick lube and they decide i don't like this industry anymore or i want to do sales i want to do finance i want to start my own shop i want to do something else so um i think porter is like being a service porter is like the the bare minimum and if you don't like it from there then you can do something else. But lube tech is, if you really do want to pursue this passion, start as a lube tech. And if you like it from there, then you you have a good foundation of what it's like to you know, be a technician, what the essentials are, how to do time management, stuff like that. Uh, and if you are a lube tech and you say, I hate this, I hate being dirty, I hate like working in the fast paced environment, then you know you don't like it, so. Yep, and kind of the timeline for for a technician so you're gonna if you start off as a lube tech you're gonna be a lube tech for a while and if it's something you want to do and a while can vary a while can be six months or three years like could, you don't know what a while it is could be it could be a, it could be a very long while yeah um, and then you go from lube tech to apprentice and then when you're an apprentice that's when you work underneath a technician you know like um, say you work under me I would basically be your teacher for that time that you're an apprentice yeah you would learn from me you know um you wouldn't you know i wouldn't just have you go hang parts and you know put these brakes on and stuff um but then if if you go on and you're an apprentice and then you say hey you know i'm comfortable i feel like i know enough yeah i want to start i want to start doing making it on my own because while you're an apprentice you're still going to be hourly because you know, manager is not going to expect you to survive and yeah, turn you know, hours, and you know, flat rate, and you know, make make money. Um, but once you once you get off of being an apprentice and you're online, you are making money for yourself. If you if you struggle, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna suck. You're not gonna come off yeah and make 150 hours. You know, your first pay period. It, it being going from you know, if you do decide to stick with this industry and. You know, maybe you do start as porter and you like it, lube tech, you like it, and then you become an apprentice and you like it, and you go on your own uh, in a perfect world if that happens. I, I did it that way, and that is the scariest thing is when I was an apprentice and I was working for a uh, um, 
a little bit older technician um a little bit more experienced not older i'm gonna say but um i i was i felt like i was doing everything for him i felt like i was you know like i went to my service manager and i said man i'm i'm doing all these hours and you know i can go on my own i can do it and he said are you sure and i said yeah i can do it and like dave said once you go on your own once you go from apprentice and you actually make that leap and you become your own technician you are 100 percent commission so all these hours that i was getting fed as an apprentice you know i thought oh you know i'm just having my uh, my teacher essentially that was above me telling me what to do with the car yeah. and i was fixing it and i said oh this is awesome amazing i'm doing all the work for him i could do this all on my own but i went on my own and learning how to diagnose the car and how to you know even pull in the car and rack it yourself and that is one of the scariest experiences and i remember i was making nothing when i was you know by myself and my own technician i was making nothing and i fell flat on my face but i eventually picked up you know i was doing good i was one of the top um maybe top four or five in the shop which is good out of yeah. eight or nine i guess yeah, yeah. i didn't totally suck yeah, but you were rolling yeah but it's 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 no joke man um you know and that's the thing with flat rate too if you're not if you're not working you're not making any money you're not you can't yeah. just come to work and say oh i yep. you know i could i could be here for eight hours and only have made three hours worth of work today yeah because i got my butt kicked you know diagnosing this car or tearing this engine apart and i haven't gotten paid you know that's it's yeah it's a rough industry and that goes back to me saying like you have to be 110 percent committed to understanding what you are getting yourself into yeah once you understand everything about about it and it's still something you want to do do it because you, you see like you know you you might have like your your dad or like your uncle that used to wrench on cars or like a friend of a friend that works on cars or someone else you know everyone has that driveway mechanic friend or right you know, uncle. and they they all say oh you can make good money with this you can make decent money with this but these are the technicians that have their ASC certifications and stay past the eight to five hours or nine to six or whatever it be they're putting in overtime um, well there is no overtime but when they put in extra hours that um, you know that are necessary like that are like off the clock supposedly like so to say um, yeah there's there are some nights I will be here at the shop right exactly work, working exactly. on customer cars until you know eight nine o'clock because like I said if if that car is not done I'm not getting paid so right. I will stay I will stay late to finish a car so I can get paid on it I mean that's 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 the kind of motivation I have for this job. Like I will stay and get stuff done because I like money, you know, who doesn't, Yeah. you know, and in, in this industry you can make, you can make really good money, but you have to, you have to want to. Yes. Know? Yeah. You, you literally control your own paycheck. You do. And I, I will not tell you how many guys I see that, you know, complain about, Oh, I don't make enough money or, you know, my hours suck and they leave you know, three o'clock. 4:30, and I'm like every day. Well, this is why you're not making any money. You know, I I'm here from eight o'clock sometimes until 7:30, 8 at night. I'm usually here putting in 12 hours a day. But you know, if I put in, if I flagged 15 and I was here for 10, that's a win for me. You know what I mean? I made money that day. So that's you just got to have that perspective on it too. If yeah. you want to make money, you will make money. Yeah, it, it is not going to be. You know, unless you're unless you're on like a different type, like which I've heard before, like you're on a salary or like a guarantee. Yeah, some type of guarantee. Um, which some places will do, like what if you're starting out, some managers will be like, "Look, I'm going to guarantee you this many hours because man, some managers don't want to watch you fail." And right. when you're starting out, it's gonna su <laughs> it's gonna suck. Yep. Because you're not going to be time. getting all the you're not going to you're not be getting any of the easy stuff. You don't hit they, the ground running. No, they want to see what you know and you know they're going to give you a ticket that's going to make you think and you're going to go holy crap what what did i just do you <laughs> know and so many eh, once a day <laughs> yeah and then you gotta you gotta figure it out you know and that's 
that's how it is. I got I got some of the young, some of the younger techs in here that ask me questions every day, like, mm. what do I do with this? What do I do with that? Like, I got this code here, and I'm like, you know, I gotta show them tough love sometimes. Be like, dude, you you have to figure it out. You know, yeah. like I was in your shoes five years ago. You know, like. I understand it sucks, but you, you, when you start to figure it out for your own, then you then you that's when you start to build. So, in conclusion, I guess um, you know to kind of if if someone wants to start in the industry, and this is as like a this is on the service side. Um, we've never sold cars. I don't have like a urge or anything like that to ever sell cars. Um, you know, maybe if we interview a salesman or something like that, uh, we can get that perspective. Um, but if, if one of our friends or family members, little brothers, cousins, whatever, asks us if we want or if they wanted to join this industry and, you know, take a leap of faith and like get into the automotive field, um, we've kind of gone over, you know, being a technician, it, you're going to have to put in the hours. You're going to have to throw some money out there. You're going to have to buy some tools. You're going to have to... Um, you know put some money up front and you're gonna have to ask yourself. Do you really love this? Are you passionate about this and? Um, you're gonna have to you know go in with an open mind because a lot of technicians that don't have an open mind Fail and we see that you know he Dave's probably seen it a lot too But we see them fail all the time because they think they know everything yeah. and it's just you know the, You, you got to have an open mind to be a sponge to everything no matter how old you are if you're 16 or you're 26 trying to get into industry you're 32 and you say i want to start wrenching on cars it's never you're never too old um but you have to have an open mind no matter what age you are yeah um this is definitely a job that can make you a lot of money but it's not going to happen overnight absolutely not you're going to start at the bottom you're going to be comfortable you know hourly you're going to have a paycheck um, yeah. And once you start getting into the big stuff, that's when you start making, I mean, I'm, I make good money now because I've stuck it out long enough to, you know, I knew that eventually, I knew I wasn't always going to be making, you know, whatever I was making when I started. I, I knew that, you know, the further I went, the more money I was going to make. And now it's paying off. You know, I, I got my, my degree from Lincoln, you know, um, seven years ago and six years ago. And it's finally starting to, you know, I'm starting to make really good money. Now. Yeah. So it's, you, you can make good money in it, but you have to stick it out. It's not going to happen overnight. And you are also going to have to spend money too. I mean, it's not just a job. It's not just your regular nine to five that you can go to clock in, clock out, go home. Like you got to like, put in the work, man. Like, yeah, exactly. Literally. And like Dave said, like at his independent shop, you know, like, people aren't going to hand you tools you know like no. a I was, lot i was lucky to have that as a first yeah. shop yeah oh a, a lot of shops like he said before you have to have tools um so be prepared you know you're not going to walk into a shop um there actually is one shop um that we did hear of i don't even know if it was maybe the same shop we were talking about earlier with the six porters at it um but do they supply tools to you I know they supply tool boxes. No, no, they have box. They have all their own boxes built into the but shop. Boxes, but you, you you have to buy your own tools. You literally have to dump all your tools out of your own box yeah. and put them in. But, but which is cool. Like if you're first starting out, um, and you happen to end up at a shop like that that we went to, you know, with the six porters and the fifteen service riders, which is a BMW store. Um, you know they're constantly busy if yeah. if you're slowly collecting tools you have a toolbox and you know in the last episode I said we have technicians that have boxes that have paid fifteen thousand um, dollars you know we have you know just off the top of my head there's one that has a box for eight thousand and a yeah. six thousand ten thousand dollars yeah the, the box I got was fifteen grand I didn't pay that but that's oh geez, that's, yeah. that's what my box is listed for you know I sure as hell was not gonna pay that for that but I I have a fifteen thousand dollar box. Yeah, I didn't pay that for it, but I got one. Yeah, it's insane. N now, like, I've kind of been pondering too, and Dave probably feels the same way. But you know, we get like, like service bulletins and news, and we watch the news and like look at. You know, we work in this field, so we see news of what is to come of this industry, mm -hmm. 
and electric and like yeah we see a lot of this stuff before you know 90 percent of the regular consumers do because we're yeah we're yeah true yeah. in the automotive industry like any kind of you know new new product especially we all get notified about it before it, yeah. anybody even happens like that i don't know if anybody saw that really really exciting hummer commercial for the super bowl <laughs> Yeah. We all got, you know, e emails. The and Hummer Sierra is what it looked like. Yeah, we all got emails and notifications about that yeah. months before the Super Bowl. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we're, I mean, we're we're really connected with, with the industry all around, man. It's insane. But I guess my question is, like, the industry right now, it is, it is, we're at a weird point where there's still mechanical stuff but we deal with a lot of electrical stuff but in 10 years i'm you're gonna have to be an electrician to work on these and i that is my like least strong suit that i had was diagnosing like the electrical stuff of it so i don't know you know putting that into account if i don't know 100 percent if i recommend someone to come into this industry but if you know like dave said we're they used to call them, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe even five years ago, they called them mechanics because it was mechanical things. But now we are called technicians because we deal with HVAC, with electrical, with coolant issues, you know, and every single aspect of it. So that's why they're called technicians now. But yeah, you, you knowing... no longer just need mechanical aptitude to understand how a car works. Yeah. You, you have to know how technology works too because the amount of computers these cars have now is insane insane again every other year they add more and more stuff to it if you if you would if if we we could tell you for hours what would happen to a car if you left a battery unplugged for a while every single computer on that car <laughs> is going to set a code and you're going to be chasing your tail yes. forever because of a battery that is how that is how yeah. sensitive these new cars are and these new trucks now they have brake pad sensors they have tire sensors they have trailer tire sensors yep. we have cameras in our rear view mirrors it's insane the, the amount of stuff we have in these cars it's like going beyond the abilities of normal people anymore right it's insane and it's making my job a pain in the ass <laughs> yeah so i mean like going back to you know if you do want to be a technician and come into this industry in 2020 i mean that's another thing you got to think about yeah i mean if yeah do you industry want to changing. you gotta you're you're basically gonna be an electrician and you gotta be a mechanic you gotta do both so um i'm i would think that pay you know like if you come into the industry i'd think that pay would compensate um for you know having to work on both things i'm not 100 percent sure but mm -hmm. um if you're prepared and open and willing and able and and ready to delve into broken little broken wires me and dave like when i was working by myself i had an issue electric issue that i could not figure out i was ready to have tempted to quit and walk out and it was the smallest little razor blade cut in a wire yeah. that we found in like between the front and the rear doors that was on the door um panels on the bottom so yeah. If you are open to being able to diagnose and work with electrical stuff and you're tech savvy, all by means, but just be warned, that is where the industry is going is a lot of, a lot of computers and this, technology, and stuff like that. And nowadays, if, you know, if one module isn't working, it's going to take down three or four other modules with it because yep. they share the same, the same data line yeah. and it's it's a headache but i mean if like some people like to troubleshoot stuff like that some people enjoy figuring out stuff like that like sometimes i'm not gonna lie when i get cars where like this is why i'm not a technician anymore by the way <laughs> when there's random random stuff not working and i have to get out my voltmeter and you know start probing lines and stuff to figure out if i got a broken wire or something i i hate doing that but at the same time i'm like it's really cool to break that stuff out and know that hey, I found the problem. You know that's yeah, so that, yeah. That is a, a the feeling of accomplishment. Feeling. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you if you if you like that feeling, and you can diagnose a car properly and know hey, I found I found this. It's broken here. We need to fix this part. And you know if you like 
that accomplishment, I mean, that for sure this job is for you because yeah. not every job is going to be like that. You're probably going to get like, you know, a dumb break job or something. But mm -hmm. when you do get those jobs where you do have to think, you're going to be pissed at the time. But when you finally at the end and figure it out, you're going to be like, oh, that's awesome. I can't believe it was this stupid wire right here, you know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you, it, is a, it is that feeling of accomplishment. Exactly. That I, do, I do enjoy that still to this day, you know? And yeah. If that's something you like, then this job is for sure, you know, something you want to look into as well. And one thing I forgot to touch on too, and a lot of people forget, which is like one of the main veins of the dealership is parts. Um, I do have some friends that, you know, that work in parts as well. Um, and I, I would recommend too. Also, you know, not only starting as maybe a porter or lube tech, but uh, being a parts driver because you that might be like a little bit more of an advantage because you get to see, you get to deliver the parts to the technicians and see exactly, you know, like you get to see that parts recommendation where the customer came in for X Y Z complaint. You get to see what the technician parts requested or prepped out. And then you grab that part and you bring it to the technician. Like you kind of almost see the whole circle of life, I guess, yeah. of how it was diagnosed, what fixed it, what didn't fix it, and what part it's going to take. Um, you know, parts driver or like a beginning, like a parts guy that puts stuff back on the shelves. I don't know the technical name for it, but um, parts is also a good starting point too, um, which I kind of wish I might have started there. Um, but I, I, you know, parts is definitely like a main vein of the dealership too, and that is yeah. a good stepping point, or stepping stone. Yeah, it is. It is true. Like you can, you can see the beginning to the end of a repair. You can see the beginning of the ticket. You know, it says, you know, customer states this. You know, like mine, I had one that they were burning oil. You know, having to add oil every couple hundred miles and. You know, it needed pistons, so you know that parts guy in there could have said, "Oh, this car's burning oil, and he wants pistons." Exactly. He's gonna fix it with pistons and stuff, and and then you see that part, that ticket close, and yeah. the car drives off, and you're like, "Huh." Yeah. That I car got pistons today. That was kind of cool. You know, that's another good spot to start, and you can. And in parts, that you deal a lot with me. You know, if you're yeah. if you're a parts oh, guy, yeah. you deal with mainly the technicians. You get worn out by sales sometimes, but. Um, you deal with technicians all day. Yes, which and is good, and you can get a good morale with them, and yeah, um, work on some relations with the technicians before you go back, which is another good spot. That's know? very yeah, it's true too. Um, you know, me me being in Quick Lube, literally every single vehicle that comes through, we do probably between twenty five and thirty five or forty uh, vehicles a day that come through. Um, you know, I literally, I have to be on the phone or messaging parts every single vehicle. So, um, you know, it's it, parts is an essential piece of it, and parts is it is a very hard and stressful job as well. Yeah. Um, even the parts driver sometimes, like you know, like we've seen parts drivers that go uh, and they drive in the snow. You know, they drive in chaotic weather situations, whatever it be, where people are huddled under our our heaters and like don't want to leave the dealership, and they send the poor parts kit out there to uh, in the snow to go pick up like one little stupid sensor or something that's like a twenty dollar sensor, yeah. twenty miles across town. So yeah, like if if I needed a timing chain and it's snowing outside and we don't have one here, you're gonna go get it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, but you get a. And that's another thing too, being a parts dude, you can, you go to different dealerships and you see how they work, you know, you can, you see sometimes like when I was even a lube tech before, you know, an hourly technician, I would have to go to other shops to pick up stuff and I could, right. you know, see where their parts department was and sometimes you get a sneak and see their shop and stuff, but yeah, it's, it just depends, man. But being in a parts is, is stressful too. Like I said in the first video. And imagine you, know, you get the wrong part for a technician that's like in a time crunch yeah. and you get the wrong part and it's on you. So yeah. that's, that's what I was just going to touch on. Like, like I was talking in the first video, um, we all work as like a, it's like a big snowball, you know, if I don't have parts, I'm not fixing a car. Yep. And if I'm not fixing a car, parts isn't getting paid. I'm not getting paid, neither is a service writer, which yeah. means the shop isn't getting paid. So, like, that goes back to the big snowball thing. I mean, parts is another very important part of the dealership. Um, 
if we don't have parts, nobody's getting paid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Part, parts is almost as important as a technician. If there were no techs and no parts, there would be no money made. Yeah, and that's one of my, like someone asked me recently, like what, I guess like a pet peeve of mine was, and it's not even at, you know, at the dealership or anything, not even at work, but in life, if, if it's not in your lane or your comfort zone, and you don't branch out and you don't break out of the box and do something out of the norm, that is what makes places hard to work. Um, you know, sometimes, honestly, we do see that here. So if we all work together, like Dave said, like it's it being, seeing as like being a lube tech as well, um, if I train my guys, and we also have one girl there, so if I train my people over there um, that are looking at oil you know, leaks or something like that, and they do catch an oil leak from the quick lube bay, then I connect with the customer and I say, hey, you have an oil leak, Let's, let me set you up with the service rider. The service rider sets up the appointment, then they come back, and then they get with the technician, and it's, it's all, we help each other. So someone that came in for a $13 oil change and I catch a leak, I give that leak to the service rider, the service rider dispatches it to the technician, the technician goes to parts and says I need this part to fix it, and we all had just worked together to solve a problem, to help get this leak fixed, or whatever it be, not even a leak, but whatever the situation yeah, be. Whatever it was, could be something yeah. as simple as a yeah. nail in a tire, you know? Right. Like, this lady, could have had no idea she needed a tire, but we saw a nail in it. Yeah. She needed a tire. Parts sold us a tire. Technician put the tire on. We just made, you know. Yeah. You know, customer left in a safe car. You know, the shop made some money. Everybody's happy. You know, it's yeah. We, we all. Every dealership is the same. I know this for a fact. But you have to work together. You have to connect with other departments, and you know. know. Ooh, that is my biggest pet peeve yeah. in dealerships. If you don't work together, you the fail. shop is going to fail. Yeah, absolutely. If if you have, you know, people that aren't, you know, on board with whatever's going on, anything that's going on in the shop, like certain, if there are some people in there that aren't, you know, agreeing to, you know, certain ways or anything, something stupid, you know, if there's just that one person that's off, and doesn't want to, you know, you know, join the herd. Yep. You're gonna have, you know, that one random off link, you know, that's trying to do his own thing, and it's your shop is not gonna function right. Absolutely. Everybody has to be on the same page, and everything will, mo will go smooth. You know. I I made I make for those of you that don't know I make motivational videos, and there was a video I made a long time ago. It was called Bad Bananas, and I had a bowl of, I think, I don't know why I didn't throw them out. I had a bowl of like four bad, like brown, nasty, disgusting bananas. And soggy. Yeah, the nasty bananas that like supposedly are healthy for you that like uh, I don't, never going to eat anyway. Never touch a brown banana. But I had a fruit bowl full of like four brown bananas and I went to the store and I don't know why I was in a rush or something and I put the uh, three green, brand new bananas on top of those. Um, and then I like did my laundry and stuff and I went to bed and I woke up the next morning and those three bananas that I had just got that were green, that were good, they turned literally brown the next day. And that's why I called the motivational video the bad bananas because you have people here, you know, coming into this industry, if you are brand new, you will learn that one person, your, your service manager, your parts guy, your quick lube guy, your service rider, uh, any technician, you have one bad banana in this entire shop they will for sure it changes the entire morale exactly they will for sure affect you and your mood and that trickles down that's a domino effect to everyone in the place that you're working at not even just the dealership but anywhere you work at don't be the bad banana if you're working around the bad banana just cut it out I know. you I mean, know get away from them you can even think of it in any it doesn't even have to be at work if you if you're if you're around anybody bad in general, Absolutely. it's gonna make you feel like ass. You know, yes. you're not gonna want to do anything. You're gonna be pissed off. It's like it's like going to the DMV, 
on a lunch break, you know, you're gonna walk in, everybody's all irritated. And then what happens to you when you leave? <laughs> yeah, you're irritated, you were there for way longer than you wanted to be. Absolutely but you, true. You leave there annoyed because you got there and everybody was pissed off. But you went in there saying, oh cool, let me get my license renewed today, or I just gotta get my plates. And you end up spending two hours at the DMV and now you're pissed. Yep. Because, because you were in there with a bunch of bad bananas, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's how it is anywhere, but yeah, like especially in the dealerships, if there's one, one bad, if one person is having a bad day, the entire shop can feel it. Yes. If you're having a bad day, go home. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, call, I call into work. It, yeah, it would much rather you would much rather be better off not coming to work and being shorthanded than coming to work pissed off and then rubbing off on everybody else because then everybody else is going to be all salty and yeah you know everybody's gonna start kicking stuff and you know slamming doors and then it just turns into a big old mess yeah and it's just not a not a healthy work environment man it's not i i recently reached well i didn't reach out but i had a friend that i had connected with um recently from a long time ago and he was saying you know he has his own business and he does his own thing and he does you know stuff with the automotive industry as well and his biggest number one like you can have tattoos you can have tattoos on your neck you can be a little bit late you can take an hour and a half lunch break you can do whatever it be but the number one he said he didn't even say number one he said the number zero most fireable offense the biggest pet peeve to him was if you're having a bad attitude you're done you're fired and that's how it should be you know i thought man that's kind of ruthless like that's that's kind of a bad way to like you know run business but the more i thought about it the more i thought like you know that's that is one of the best ways to run business because you know not i'm not saying this dealership uh anywhere any industry the auto industry for sure i've worked in clothing retail i worked in cell phone retail um yeah. i've worked in workhouse or i mean uh, warehouses and stuff like that but um you you come into a shop not even a dealership i'm going to say shop because i know wood shops and mechanic shops and um metal work shops and like other factories and stuff you have that bad negative attitude and it just it, it kind of is everywhere it, you can't get rid of it it is everywhere in every shop it's not a dealership thing it's not an independent thing it's it's in every shop it's so everywhere. just get away from those people that are bringing those vibes it's everywhere yeah doesn't matter what you're doing yes just stay away <laughs> you know what's funny is when i worked at michael's i worked at michael's arts and crafts when i was uh you're supposed to be 16 years old i was 15 years old my mom's uh, best friend was the manager there. I she doesn't work there, so she's not gonna get in trouble. Um, but when I worked there, you know, I've had probably six different jobs in my 31 years of existence. And when I worked at Michael's Arts and Crafts when I was 15, I worked with I think six women that were 55 years or older, and that was the most chaotic most drama i have ever been around in my whole working life and yeah. you know you would never think that but it's everywhere you know i get it it's at whatever industry whatever you're doing there's going to be drama there's going to be stuff like that so i don't mean to scare like newbies off or people that are trying to come into the industry oh, yeah. um no. it's everywhere but just just be warned that it's a shop thing you know i've seen auto body shops where i've taken my vehicles to auto body shops and they're got grease prints and just throwing paperwork around and saying it'll be done i mean it it'll should be tomorrow i don't know like it's just a shop thing so be prepared for that to be a present you know in in this industry um it's it's not one spot it's like everywhere in this industry oh yeah it doesn't matter where you're at i'm sure it even happens in sales oh yeah yeah S sales <laughs> sales that's like that's a different video or a different podcast you know, yeah different different episode I, I want to pick a salesman's brain because I feel like we need a we need a good one though we can't you know get you know we need a non biased opinion we need yeah sales is its own it's its own monster up there yeah that that is one thing you know I'm a I'd like to say I'm a great salesman in in everything and anything we, we need to talk to somebody who was in sales and is like 
still affiliated with it, but not selling. Yeah, I think I have someone in mind. I think so too. Um, um, because th yeah. their their opinion is going to be the most non-biased because they're they sold, they know how it went, and they don't do it anymore. So we, I think that's where we're going to go next. And see what they, yeah. what they say. And you know what I'm curious is that a lot of it, it's funny like it's we hear this at the dealership. A lot of people that sell think they can work on the vehicles and a lot of people that work on the vehicles said I bet I can outsell them yeah. I'm curious like I'd love to do like a, a like a swap a freaky Friday like <laughs> once with right. just a technician and a salesperson right. but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your job you take mine I would go sell a car and I want to see one of them come fix some cars and I'm not saying like a salesman couldn't work on them yeah. um, because there's there's a lot of salesmen especially here that are like inclined and know um, you know, actually, I do know one salesman up front that used to be a lube tech, and then he actually went to go sell cars, and he does know a little bit about the vehicles, um, you know, enough to um, sell them and not look like a, a dummy up there. Yeah. Um, but I'm not saying you have to have that skill to not look like a dummy, but um, I'm just, I'm curious. I want to get a salesperson side of things and just kind of like how they feel about the dealership and if they would recommend um, that kind of lifestyle to someone to be on the sales side. Um, but I guess kind of wrapping it up and, and going back to everything because we could talk about this for hours. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of things we didn't talk about. A lot of things we probably should have talked about, but um, in conclusion, if, if me and Dave had little brothers and they were 16 to 19 years old and said, I want to get into the automotive industry. What would you tell them? Yes or no? Just with everything that we've just covered and went over. I mean, just keeping in, in fact, you're going to have to put in a lot of hours. You're going to have to work overtime. You know, you're going to have to um, put up money for your tools and it's not going to be easy. You're going to fall. You're going to run into hiccups and you're going to run into bad days you're gonna run into negative people at your shop would you still recommend your little brother to come work in the auto industry whether it be a dealership an independent uh, being a, a lot tech lube tech um, porter detailer parts guy whatever it be would you recommend your family member to come work in the automotive industry yeah I would yeah, it's been it's been it's been great to me for the six years I've been in it. Yeah, um, definitely rough starting out, but yeah, it's oh yeah, it's great. I I I would agree too. Um, if I had a little brother and he asked, or you know, he said he was interested in whatever part of this industry, um, I'd say yes because this is where bef before I was in this industry and like you know being a loop tech manager um, being a service advisor you have to sell you have to get in front of like people that are you know obviously you know I was like uh, 23 24 years old going up to experienced 55 60 year old old mechanics you know like that have been doing this or like people that were um, way more knowledge than me and getting out there and learning how to sell things I have become a stronger salesperson I have you know become less shy i have learned being a technician i have learned so much that you can take for the rest of your life so i would recommend yes getting into the auto industry sticking with it and staying with it that's on you um but i suggest people you know if you're interested to try it out and if you don't like it then that's on you but i would recommend it because you learn a lot about life and you learn a lot about hands-on experience without you know being like a a farmer or factory worker or something like that like you get almost right. the best of both worlds even if you don't do this for the rest of your life I mean I I don't plan on doing this for the rest of my life right but I have learned so much and it's it's a great skill to have how many absolutely people, I mean I have family members that even forget that I'm a mechanic they will go <laughs> they will take their car yeah. to some random person and then and then they will finally wait until their car is almost non salvageable to say, Oh wait, Dave's a mechanic. Yeah. You know, and it's it's a great skill to have. You know, I have not had to pay for a repair on my car, you know, like labor wise since I started. And yeah. I, I know how costly fixing your car can be because I am the guy fixing them. Yeah. I, I know. 
and I'm glad that I got into this because now when I get out of this industry, I have all these tools and I can do anything I will ever need to on my own stuff. And that is, exactly. that is where I look at this in the long run. Like I'm, I'm not going to be some 60 year old mechanic, you know, still doing this stuff, but I will have all these tools in my own personal garage and I will be able to do whatever I need to, whenever I need to, because I invested, you know, if it's, you know, just this six years now or, you know, 10 years of my life into this industry, I have all this experience now and that's, yeah, that's what I'm getting out of it. And if that's if that's all you want to do it for is to get you know some experience and learn how to work on some cars so you can you know fix your own stuff when you need to then do it man you know i i think dave touched on it i don't know if it was this episode or last episode um when he said you know when maybe it was this episode where he said you when you are a technician or literally even like me too uh working in the uh lube area the lube bay whatever you want to call it um you learn time management yeah and I translated that into real life and like when you're a technician and you're here, so you're scheduled for eight hours a day, you have to learn how do I make as much as I can within that eight hours because being a technician, you can have 20 smoke breaks, you can go get lunch, you can, you you're know. You're not an hourly employee. Yeah, you can do whatever, you, you can sit here, you can text for four hours out of your eight hour shift, but. You have to get work done at the same time. Yeah, you're making your own paycheck. And and me and, you know, Quick Lube, we have almost 40 cars that come through a day. Yeah. And we're telling these people, you know, these people don't want to come in and wait. Like, people just instantly want it. And it's, I get that it's kind of a nuisance um, that you have to go out of your way and you have to wait 30 minutes, hour, two hours sometimes. If you're coming in on a Saturday, sometimes we literally, no joke, have people wait four hours for oil changes and you learn time management. And that's why I instill in those, uh, the people that I work with, hey, we need to do 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes a car maximum. And you're learning how to maintain, you know, 30, 40 vehicles in 20 minutes with five guys. Like it's a lot of time management and being a technician, being whatever, being a parts guy, you got to learn to get to that dealership as safely and quickly as possible, get that part and come back, deliver it to the technician so he can get his job done. It's, it's all a lot of time management squeezed into, um, services day, you know, it is like, like for instance, I, I have a, an engine that I have to replace, you know, and say the customer needs it in two days, I have to figure out how the heck I'm going to get everything sorted out and get that engine and replaced in that car in two days, you know, and running and safe for that customer, you know, like I have to, that's where my time management comes in. I, if I don't get that engine done, this customer's not going to have their car. My boss is going to be pissed, you know, and I'm not going to have any money. So it's, that's kind of yeah. how the time management works too. Like, and you know, we get you know these random cars that want to be done by one, or I have to have this fixed by this time. Yep. Or even like the customer might just want to know what's wrong with their car before they even leave. That's called a waiter, you know. Yeah. I'll have a waiter come in, and they want to know why their car is doing this, and they're sitting in the lobby, you know. And I have to say, okay, well, yeah, it's absolutely, yeah. It's eight thirty. I have to tear this engine apart, but I have this. This waiter, you know, they need a they need an answer by ten. Okay, so you learn how to juggle some you know, crazy, crazy things. Yeah, but time management and like I, I mean, I would not have done anything different. I'm I'm glad I got into this industry. It's yeah, it's taught me I, a lot yeah. about myself. It's taught me a lot mechanically. Um, I'm I'm happy with it. Like if, yeah. if I were to tell anybody that's interested in doing it go for it you know yeah, me me as me as well um and not only you know like i said these are the, like the pros i guess like time management um and then another one would be um personal skills like personable st skills i guess are, is what i'm trying to say like how are you with people yeah like even no matter what role you have here you're talking to people, yeah. you know, being a technician, you're, you're talking to other technicians. You're talking to the porters, you're talking to the service riders. Sometimes you got to talk to the, um, customers. I have to go on yeah. test drives with customers. Exactly. Know? And, and me being in quick lube, I mean, I 
constantly am communicating with multiple people all day on, hey, we got this car next, hey, we got to get this out right now, yeah. and if I need to upsell some work, I go and talk to the customer and I say, you know, there can be 12 people in the waiting room, and I got to stand there like I'm doing a presentation, and I got to say, hey, your air filter is dirty, it costs blah, 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 and you need a 50K, the driveline service, transmission flush, whatever it be, I have to stand there and I have to present that in front of 12 people, I can't like, pull them out of the waiting room and say, hey, yeah. can I talk can to I you? Can I talk to you outside? Yeah, room? I can't like, hey, <laughs> hey uh, so uh, you're, you're gonna, cause you're not going to sell that way, so. Um, Confidence. Yeah, oh, absolutely, like. Especially as a tech. Yeah. Oh, you, no matter what position you are. It doesn't matter, you need confidence as well, and that. Yeah. Being a mechanic has gave me a lot of confidence too. Like, you have to learn to trust yourself. With True. anything you're doing, you know, like, t when it, even with it just talking to people, you have to know like okay i'm not gonna go in there and just you know step all over my tongue you know i gotta yeah i gotta sell this stuff you know i gotta tell them what's wrong with their car and then me and a mechanic i have to know that i'm doing it right you know yeah you like <laughs> you, have to, you have to or you're not you're gonna fail if you if you're constantly stuck in your head you know you're not confident you don't trust yourself you're just not gonna yeah not gonna fail gonna like fail. uh with something that stuck in my head when i went to driving school school when I was 15 and getting my permit license whatever it's been so long but um, a vehicle is a weapon and in the most non I don't know how to even explain this but you, like in driving school I remember them saying that your vehicle is a weapon and just to think that Someone, if they come in with the check engine light, someone's leaking coolant, whatever it be, someone comes in, they have an oil leak. You need to have confidence, like what Dave's saying, that you need to bring it to the back shop, diagnose it. If they okay the work, you get the work done. And you have to have confidence because if you don't have confidence and you say, I don't know if I did this oil leak right, I don't know if I fixed this right, I don't know if I did this right. And when you go on a test drive and you need to know and understand someone's family, someone's wife, someone's husband, people are going to be in this vehicle. So you need to have confidence that when this vehicle, whatever is wrong with it, when it comes into the shop, I'm 100% confident that I'm going to fix this and it's going to have family, kids, wife, dog, husband, aunts, grandmas, grandpa. You pretend like your family is in that vehicle, you're going to get it done correctly and you need, need confidence because I've been in that situation where I've done an oil change back here. I, I've, when I was a lube tech, I did oil changes in my sleep. But when I became a technician and I did an oil change as a technician and I was so paranoid and scared being a technician on my own, I didn't even know if I did the oil change right. So you need, like Dave's right, you do need confidence in your work. And even if it's wrong, he comes back and says, I tried, but we're gonna make this right. But you need confidence because if you go in half ass and it's not right then you you make mistakes yeah. and not you can't have you can't have any of those in the auto industry yeah yeah you you, you, know, you, you just end up on a YouTube fail or something <laughs> like that. yeah and, and mistakes are going to happen um, to, to newbies to people trying to um, get a feel for this mistakes are going to happen I mean I see some of the the lube techs not now um, some previous lube techs we've seen forget to put the oil filter on and start the vehicle, forget to put the drain plug in and start the vehicle, double gasket it, forget to put oil in it. Um, things happen and it's going to happen and even you know, as a technician, you leave grease on the door handle, um, you forget to put the lube sticker in, I mean you forget to put the cap on after you do the oil change, whatever it be, like you forget to top off the coolant after you did a water pump or something like... Washer fluid. Yeah. You, you, Nine I mean, times out of ten it's the little stuff that the customers are going to notice. Of but. course. M mistakes they're, are going gonna to happen, happen regardless. I'm, I've been doing this for six years and I still make mistakes, but if you, as long as you can catch them and know that you did it... Me own up to them? Yeah, then you you, yeah. you know what you're doing. But if you're just gonna, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not gonna, that's not gonna fix anything. That that is, I think that's the biggest thing. Seeing like being on both sides of the fence, like the service and the the technician side. If 
if you don't own up to your mistakes, if you don't say, hey, I stripped out this drain bolt. Hey, I lost this tool. Hey, I forgot to put oil in this and I messed up this guy's motor. Hey, I lost these keys. Like, Yeah, if you don't own up to it, management says, why do we need this guy that won't own up to his mistakes? But when you see... What are we doing with this guy? Um, yeah, because well, you know, if you own up to mistakes, whatever it be, um, then that makes it easier for the service riders and the service manager or foreman or whatever to say they made a mistake, they owned up to it, we'll get it fixed. But if you say I I don't know what happened or blame someone else, you're probably not going to be working in this industry or this place much longer no. because that is a huge thing and people don't see past that. But, um, you know, just to kind of wrap things up, me and Dave agreed if we had someone, not even our younger brother, if, if we had someone our age, if we had someone randomly off the streets ask us if we recommended the auto industry, any part of the auto industry, um, dealership, um, independent shop, you know, starting your own, whatever it be, we both say yes. Uh, there are pros and cons, obviously, just like any job, any location, any shop, there's pros and cons, but um, we'd say yes. So if you're contemplating, thinking about it, do a little bit more research. Don't even just rely on us. Uh, yeah. But just from, from me and Dave's background, history, and what we see every day and where we see the industry going, um, you know, it's going really computer tech savvy heavy. And if you're open to doing that, then we'd say, you know, get into it. But where the industry is right now, um, it is a good place. It's a, You learn, like we just talked about. I mean, it's it builds your confidence. Um, being on the service side, I don't know about sales side. Probably does that too, but um, builds your confidence, time management, and it just has skills like Dave said skills. right like, like Dave said um for the rest of his life even if he's not going to do this for the rest of his life he will know how to be mechanically inclined and do this for the rest of his life um he's currently you know aspiring to uh be a firefighter so um that you know this job I could probably speak for him when I say this job has helped him physically mentally you know with the time management with the physical labor with the um personable stuff it's helped in every aspect so this could be like a catapult into something bigger uh, i don't see myself doing this the rest of my life um but i have the confidence i have the skills the tools the knowledge from literally everything from picking up cigarette butts to working on the vehicles to selling five thousand dollar motor jobs I can take this anywhere and I don't plan on going anywhere soon but I feel like everything I've learned up until right now I can take wherever I want yeah and the nice thing is too the auto industry is not going anywhere recession proof job I mean people are always gonna have a car that needs to be fixed you know it might get a little rough at the dealerships because we tend to charge a little bit more but that's because we are all certified in what we do, you know. We yeah. We, we're held to a higher standard, and that's why we charge. Yeah. For that, but I mean, people are always going to need their cars fixed, um, and they're all there. There are always going to be a need for technicians. We are in a technician drought. Yes. So I mean, if you, if this is something you want to do, do it. I I think I heard when he said technician drought. I think I heard like the industry in the United States is like seven hundred fifty thousand or five hundred thousand below where we need to be for technicians so um i don't know how many times i can tell you i see a hiring sign at the shop or dealership. Yeah. i mean i'll just be on craigslist like looking at like used cars to try to buy and random shop shop ads will pop up and say oh, you know hiring this and hiring that so yeah recession proof job you will never like you will never be out of a job if you get into this industry it, it is really weird to see that, uh, like I said, I've been to the dealership um, eight, eight and a half years, almost nine years, um, maybe three or four years ago, I'm not sure, when I was the lube tech manager the first time around, I had people applying and I had stacks of applications and resumes. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we gotta go fishing. <laughs> it's insane. You gotta, you gotta ask friends of friends, you gotta ask your mom's cousins brothers neighbors sister if they want to work here and it is kind of weird um so there's going to be a shortage of technicians 
um, I feel because there is now but if if you are looking know your worth and know what you're getting yourself into and know that this industry is awesome it, it does get stressful this is not like folding shirts at PacSun when I worked there <laughs> this is not like you know like when you have to um, go and clean the bathroom like this is like this is a lot of chaotic hectic situations in any shop any any body shop wood shop whatever it be any shop vibe and environment is going to be like that but um just to wrap this up it's totally worth it yeah it, it is worth it you know for like i said even if you are a porter or lube tech and you say i hate this industry i don't like it at least you can look back in your life you and tried. you exactly you tried and you didn't like it, but you tried, and you know a little bit more about dealers, and know that they're not—they're not bad guys, um, or women. We're not discriminating. Yeah, just, just know that you don't have to jump in it and be a technician right away. You That's do. probably the worst way, honestly, of, you, of jumping into exactly. it. Exactly. You can jump in just to see the vibe, see how it is, and you know, if you want to be a tech, you know, when you're off the clock, go chat with the mechanic. Go chat with the techs in the back. Definitely, yeah. You know, talk to them about their life. Talk to them about what they do in the day. Yeah. You know, because we, we can sit here and talk all day long, but until you, you know, experience it firsthand, it's it's totally different. But yeah. I, I still would definitely recommend it. I mean, if you're thinking about it, you already have that thought that you want to yeah. do it. You're so going to regret not trying it. Just try it. You know, and that's why I made up eventually made up the courage to leave that mom and pop shop I started at and applied at a dealership I was scared as hell but when I got there I was like this is pretty cool you yeah know? and look at me now you know six years later of course and and if you're still listening and you're interested we're hiring for <laughs> different positions right. um, but anyway gonna wrap this up this episode episode two of if you would recommend someone starting in the auto industry in 2020 yeah. um we will be back with more new episodes uh probably next week we're gonna try and get on a schedule i will release a schedule uh as soon as we get something figured out here um some, we need some different talks too huh yes stuff to talk about i mean yeah we you, could talk about shops all day yeah yeah and this is just our experience like we have such a narrow um we haven't even talked about like tools and yeah, like, oh yeah, equipment and we have such a narrow field of what we see. We would love to have different people in on our talks. Like I said, we want to get um, parts people, service advisors, people that are at independent shops, people that have started their own shops, um, salesmen, saleswomen, um, owners. We're we're going to talk to. Uh, a lot of different people um, this is only episode two of many so stay tuned yeah stay tuned like subscribe share with someone um tell someone to subscribe hit the bell notification yep. um but we're gonna wrap this one up we're calling it a night yep. thanks for listening yes thank you for tuning in <laughs> uh we're probably like almost hour and a half or so which is insane but uh we're out of here we will see you next time thank you for coming peace see ya